Before you begin, let me say that I am not a biased person by any means. If characters evil and they show traits of being evil, then surely they must be evil, for one reason or another. As Azeroth has shown us, not everyone who is evil is evil of their own volition. We have things like Bolvar as the new Lich King, and the Void Gods or the Void Lords, respectively, manipulating people's brains. Thus, if a story dictates that a character's evil, there should at least be a valid reason that they're evil other than they reach a mental breaking point that was never really indicated beforehand. Even with psychopaths and sociopaths, you see some symptoms and some characteristics that crop up before they go full-blown Norman Bates and start stabbing people wearing their mother's face mask in showers, you know? With that out of the way, let's begin. The Banshee Queen, Sylvanas, has undergone quite a detailed and tragic story on her way to being the War Chief of the Horde, and as such, has come under fire for her, quote, monstrous actions. But in the grand scheme of things, are her actions monstrous or justified? In a world filled to the brim with spacefaring devourers of worlds, a legion hell-bent on eradicating all life, and gods that have proven that what seems benevolent, noble, and righteous may not always be what it seems, join me on this segment of World of Warcraft news as we take a deep dive into the mind of Sylvanas. Now, a bit of a history primer, Sylvanas wasn't always the undead leader of the Forsaken we know her to be now, and most loreheads like myself will remember her tragic death defending her homeland of Silvermoon from the Lich King and his invading Scourge. After her resurrection and inevitable escape from the shackles of Dominion the Lich King held over her, she decided to, after his death, throw herself off the top of Ice Crown Citadel and slash her undead body on the jagged, crystallized blood of an old god, which is essentially Void Lords taking little pieces of themselves off and flicking them into space and seeing where they go. She then went to WoW Hell, and a Valkyr told her that she would take Sylvanas' place because, well, the Forsaken, the undead freed from the control of the Lich King, needed their queen. Now, of course, with that, she inevitably did some questionable things, but also some rightly justified ones as well. Let's start with some of her undefendable actions, namely the attack on Gilneas. Something that everyone says Sylvanas was at fault for. However, it wasn't her decision to go after Gilneas. It was everyone's favorite warmongering warchief, Garrosh. That Negrandian son of Grom Hellscream, the orc who sacrificed his life to lift the blood rage from all the fellow orcs. The guy who famously uttered the line in the battle with Thrall, You made me what I am. No, well, he wasn't wrong there. He led like an orc. Take what you must by force and trample all who get in the way. And the invasion of Gilneas was due to the need for a port city in Southern Lordaeron, so hey! Invade the stupid Gilneans that have been hiding behind a wall for the past 40 years. The invasion of Gilneas was more her following orders than her directly saying, Hey, I don't like that Grey Mane fellow, let's go kill all those people. In fact, it was many crippling blows and general art of war strategies that led to Gen Grey Mane's now notoriously blinding lust for revenge. In wartime, it may be advantageous to capture or kill the enemy leader in order to deal a crippling blow to the enemy army's morale. Imagine seeing your king laid low, broken, and bloodied by the enemy. Lifeless. It'd probably do one of two things. Make you lust for the death of the enemy and send you into a blind rage, or, more than likely, it would cripple the spirit of your people entirely. Now, unfortunately, as most people know, before Sylvanas shot her arrow meant for Gangramane, his son, of his own volition, mind you, jumped in front of his father, the arrow piercing his chest instead of his father's. Something one can call a valiant self-sacrifice. Sure, you could blame Sylvanas for trying to kill an entire population under orders of her mad and sadistic warchief who likely would have had her killed for disobeying orders, or you could see it as a wartime strategy that ultimately backfired. The arrow, either way you look at it, was meant for Gen Greymane, not his son Liam. Moving forward in time from the rise of Deathwing to Legion where she had a bit more prominence in the argument that she is quote evil, Vol'jin, the war chief who replaced Garrosh after his reign of tyranny was laid low by the brave and valiant player base is impaled on a burning legion polearm. Sylvanas, seeing the only recourse, decides to call for a retreat to save the rest of the Horde's leadership. Now again in wartime, saving your people by retreating from a costly battle is often a wise move, and unfortunately Gan used his rather broken logic to say that the Horde was betraying us again, and ultimately it resulted in another character sacrificing themselves to save their people. In this case, the beloved man Mountain Varian Wren. Sure, we got to see a more mature Anduin Rin trying to sway the hearts of his people and prove that he can just be as much of a unifying force as my dad. I'm just as good as dad. And that arc was actually really spectacular with him finding his father's sword left on the broken shore we'd been slain, but it just doesn't feel right. I mean, you know, Gen Greymane couldn't see us. He's not Mr. Fantastic. He couldn't stretch up there. Why does he automatically just go for the, oh, she's betrayed us again? 
Moving on, Anderhal. The place in the Plague Lands that inevitably became a war zone between the Alliance and the Horde after a bunch of reformed Scourge moved in. The Alliance and the Horde only went to each other's throats after the Scourge were mostly cleaned up, and Sylvanas stepped in, not wanting to lose that fight, used her Dark Valkyr to win it, and... well, here comes the dark part about Anderhal. Despite the fact that she won the battle, she was not too happy with Kul'Tira, the Blood Elf Death Knight. You might remember Kul'Tira as the Death Knight you save from the Scarlet Crusade's castle in the Death Knight Starter Zone. He was taken to the Undercity to, quote, be forced to serve the Forsaken despite his former ties to the Knights of the Ebon Blade. Now, all of this reasoning was because of his conversing with his old human Death Knight friend, the Sarian, who had sided with the Alliance after the Battle of Light's Hope. This is somewhat of a no-brainer. You obviously don't want one of your warriors going turncoat, but the whole prospect of torture, and at the very least, mental brainwashing slash conditioning is more than a little f***ed up. Now, during Cataclysm, South Shore, a place some members of the Alliance fled to after the First War, was devastated by the plague. Now, that's just a misfortune. The plague is something that a lot of players call into question. When something is so inherently deathly, no, I'm not misspeaking, not deadly, deathly, like it carries the essence of death. When it has that quality in enough quantity that Alex Straza herself, Queen of the Red Dragonflight who carries the moniker of the Life Binder, seeks to destroy it wherever it crops up because it's an affront to life, you know, it might be just a bit much. Now for a huge one. Teldrassil. Oh, how I have seen so many pissed off druids about this one. You know who you are. And is a former druid who turned her claws to the darkness of the fell and draws upon the twisty nether to bend demons to my will. I feel my former druid brothers and sisters. Seeing the world tree turn to ash is a horrid thing for many, and there are reasons as of yet unexplained. Much like the GFK shooting, we don't really know who did it yet. Who is the Lee Harvey Oswald, and who is the Jack Ruby of the Teldrassil Burning? We have speculations, but we really don't have any concrete information just yet. When Sylvanas mentions it at the beginning of the War of Thorn, she explicitly stated that she wanted to capture Teldrassil, not raise it to the ground. But let's real quickly look at the history of the world trees in general. Now, Nordrassil was the original, the OG, the tree that granted the Night Elves immortality. It was a target for the Burning Legion, the cosmic-spanning threat that sought to extinguish all life and creation, with the inevitable realization that if no life existed and all plants were nothing but scorched-out husks, the Void couldn't corrupt them and use them for their own nefarious means. Now, Nordrassil was blessed by two of the dragon aspects, which are extremely powerful dragons that have been blessed by titans. Nas Dormu of the Bronze Dragonflight used his power over time to grant the Night Elves immortality, and you see Sarah, the Dreamer of the Green Dragon Flight, used her blessing to grant them access to the Emerald Dream. However, it should be noted that it doesn't seem druids need the blessing, as Malfurion could enter the Dream during the War of the Ancients. It might just be strong druids can enter the Dream? I don't know. Archimonde, however, during the second Burning Legion invasion, sought to drain the power of Teldrassil to rival his master Sargeras in overall cosmic strength. Now, Malfurion used the Horn of Cenarius to summon Wisps, who inevitably quite literally bit Archimonde to death. So they actually gathered around him and detonated with the power of a nuclear blast because nature doesn't like scumbags, but his death burned the mighty world tree. And although it's healed over the course of the game, it was also inevitably the target of Ragnaros the Fire Lord. So the original tree had two titanic baddies who wanted to A, drain its power, and B, wanted to turn it to ash. What about the other lesser world trees? Well, Vordrasil was corrupted by the old god of death, yogg saron and this inevitably corrupted the wild bear god, Ursok, who was in the Emerald Dream. Speaking of the Emerald Dream, Shaladrasil, the world tree from Legion, was a spawning ground for entities of the Emerald Nightmare. And of course, the Emerald Nightmare is the curse placed upon the dream by a dying Yasharaj. So one tree was the target of two titanic bad guys, one caused the corruption of a literal god, and Shaladrasil caused the death of a literal god with Ysera, and nearly cost the druids their wild god leader Cenarius. So all in all, for all the good the world trees have done, it doesn't really seem that they're a good thing. I mean, sure, the Emerald Dream is host to many druids and wild gods, namely Cenarius, Ursok, Aviana, Goldrin, Ashamane, and Malorn, but the cosmic entities that have sought to corrupt the dream and its world trees to devastate the druids and the world of Azeroth hmm, kind of leaves some worries and doubts as to whether or not they're truly necessary. As when you prod Sylvanas further before you go meet with Sarfang, she says that in order to break the spirits of the Night Elves, as she intended to do with Greymane, Malfurion must die. This has sparked outrage in so many people, some of my friends included. Again, you know who you are. But again, it's the Greymane situation. You target the unifying leader of the enemy in order to kill the spirit of their people. Why did she want to take Teldrassil? Well, 
Teldrassil offered the Alliance a way to ferry raw, unrefined Azerite from Silithus all the way back to the Eastern Kingdoms. Now, while Teldrassil was a hostile takeover, let's take a look at a similar real world situation again, Alaska. Now, it's hard to think at one point that Alaska was not part of the United States of America, but in the 1800s, it was actually a part of the Soviet Union. The Americans, in an effort to ensure their borders were secure, purchased Alaska on March 30th, 1867, from the Soviet Union for a whopping $7.2 million, which today would be $120 million due to inflation. Teldrassil is much like Undercity. Both factions have an enemy capital on their respective continents. What do you do? You negotiate, or in this case, you take it over by force, ensuring the enemy can't spy on you, which also helps to shore up your kingdom's security. It's no different than the Alliance retaliating in kind by sieging Lordaeron. Coming soon, TM. Now this is where I'm going to call my pre-Teldrassil War of Thorns and Warbringers completion statements on Sylvanas. I had a discussion with a few of my friends, and due to the fact that I won't be here this Friday, I didn't think it would make sense to try and rush through the War of Thorns and not really get to experience and analyze it from the viewpoint of both factions. So expect my post-Teldrassil and the Warbringer comic opinions on Sylvanas next Friday. Loktar Ogar, for the Horde, and of course, for the Alliance. I've been your bifactional hostess Aubrey from Everneth News, and I hope to see you all next Friday.